King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Broadcasters Podcast. Here is the King of Podcasts. Salt Burn. I finally watched it. And listen, I've been hearing about this for weeks. And to be honest, I was planning to watch this in the movie theater, but right around the end of December, they only ran it at the Regal Theater where I'm at for a couple weeks. And because of where everything was, like I had already caught four movies over the last two weeks of the year. So the weekend of Christmas and New Year's, I caught, you know, back to back movies. I, it was kind of hard for me to go ahead and put all the time in to watch all of them. So th- that was the problem that I had there, but that movie was out there. And if I had more time, I would have gone to see it in the theater, but I don't know if it would have been a good idea. <laughs> I'll be honest. This is one of those movies where maybe you didn't want to see this in the theater with all the other people around you. Cause you would have felt like you were at an X rated theater. It really did feel like that a bit. Like it wasn't a porn, but I'm surprised that Saltburn didn't get to the point where you could have felt that way. But you know, it was overly graphic. But the but the sexual undertones were there, and it was <laughs> you could see it was disturbing. And I would not disagree with you. Like I was, oh boy. So I looked at that, and the story overall was good. Like I mean, they got you. This is going to be spoilers. So if you have not watched it by now, I don't know what to tell you. Like it just came out on Amazon prime, but more than a week ago, it was in movies. It was in the movie theaters. Like there's been enough time, been enough time out there for you to go and catch the movie. You've had like, you've had three months. So you just going to have to deal with the fact that, okay, it's been done and we're going to talk about it. And if you're going to be behind about it, you know what? You're not going to, you're not going to Netflix person watching suits. You just catch it. Like when everybody else catches it, like, you know, what? Six months, six years later, whatever it is. So we're not going to do that, but yeah, that's what's going on there. Now I could have talked about this. I could have talked about this on my, the praise and debaucherous series. Sure. I could have done that, but I didn't because I was like, well, no, (laughs) you know, I was like, uh, I already had the story about, Zendaya's new movie upcoming in all April called challengers. I wanted to put that ahead of time. So I put it there and I did a story about that. That was better for that show. Saltburn Saltburn could have applied, but so much more to that. Now the movie originally came out. What was it? November 27th. That was the initial November 17th. Excuse me. That was the initial opening of the theater. Right. And we didn't hear a whole lot about it. Like it, it, all of a sudden we started hearing more about it. And then the movie did take off pretty well. What was it $20 million worldwide? And the budget was $12 million. So it's going to take some time, but it's going to probably make its way back and probably will be enough to go even on it. But people are going to be talking about this movie for years. There's no doubt about it. And we'll probably get some critical accolades, you know, I don't know what kind of talk it'll get after all the other movies out there, but this movie really did have your, your run of shock value. And I'm like, wow, it only started in seven theaters to start off with. And it got up to 1500. So yeah, you were limited in where you could watch it in the box office. And then when you could, it was like in and out. It's, it was one of those movies that just happens like that. And like I said, you can find it right now on Amazon Prime. And I watched it and I'm like, whoa, four scenes that really just turned me around. Like, damn, I, I thought I've seen some really salacious shit in the, in the past, but this was why, I, wow, this was a lot. So that's what happened there. Anyway, we're going to talk about it because what really is from a broadcaster standpoint is this movie has created such a stir from the music soundtrack, which was blown away. Good. All right. The soundtrack is great. I know I've added a bunch of those songs. If I didn't already have them in my playlists on Spotify, I'd just put them in. 
you're starting to see that all across where on the charts, certain songs were making their way up the charts talking about it. And that was the really fascinating thing too. So people need to go and look at that and just say, wow, this is really doing some real numbers right now. One of the songs in particular, Murder on the Dance Floor, which if you know that the character of Oliver is dancing around naked after doing some serious damage to the Catton family, and he dances around the Saltburn Mansion to the song. The song in the UK, which I believe it hit number one, I forget. Actually, no, it reached number two in the UK. It's now 22 years later, and the song has once again reached number two. In America, the song never charted. It charted on dance charts, number 26. But on the on the Hot 100, it is now number 58, and it will probably continue to climb up. So the official charts in the UK, they said that the song had its highest ever streaming week in the UK to date, 4.7 million streams over seven days. And other songs that also got really pushed across was Princess Mason and Princess Superstars Perfect Exceder Armada. I had never heard of that song, but the song hit hard. It originally picked at number three in 2006, and it's also charting again. So I was like, wow. But yeah, there's that. And by the way, movie soundtracks are obviously making a difference and making a real dent because the movie Anyone But You has caused Natasha Benningfield's Unwritten to bat, ch- bounce back into the charts once again for the first time in almost 20 years. It was 2004 that song came out. That's another story for another day. But Saltburn itself, you know, this is the kind of thing where if you want something that's not built off a lot of money and you want this thing to go and go viral, well, you in the mainstream, this is one of those few movies that have gone and crossed over into the mainstream. And it's a, it's a fascination. That's why I'm talking about on this program tonight. Because when you look at what they did and what they've been able to do to put this movie across and just shock people out of nowhere, catch people off guard doing this movie. They did. And the response to this movie across the board has been incredible. For a movie that's, you know, it's very much a, a feel, feels like a very much British movie because of where they are. And, you know, it's like for people to go and catch this movie and just see what it's all about. The cast, yeah, you might still know some of the names, but they're very much generational talent. We haven't heard much about, you know, we haven't heard much about the cast, right? I mean, we know, you know, for us in America, I mean, okay, you might know Rosamund Pike, obviously, and we know her. Barry Keegan, I didn't know much about. Jacob Lorde, I know he was in Priscilla. And among others, there were others. There were all some particular movies. By the way, of this movie, the director, screenwriter, and producer is Emerald Fennel, and Margot Robbie is one of the producers. Want to know that, too. So, Refinery29, back in November, they put ahead a pretty comprehensive spoiler filled review of the movie. And I think it's probably one of the best ones I've seen of all. We'll go through it. They say that there's something distinctly unnerving about leaving the cinema and not being able to process what you just watched. What the fuck just happened? Why am I horny? Was that a Britney Spears shirt? And that's what you would be saying after watching Emerald Fennel's new film, Saltburn. It's hard to define. It's a story about love, desire, and obsession that's part twisty psychological thriller and part laugh until you weep comedy. It's also super, super gay. And we're not saying it in a bad way. It just is. So, Barry Keegan is best known for the Banshees of Inishirin and the Killing of a Sacred Deer. We see him first as a shy scholarship student at Oxford University. Infatuated with a charming and aristocratic Felix, played by Jacob Lordy, who's uh, from Euphoria. Right, and despite clear differences, Felix invites Oliver to spend the summer at his family sprawling estate, estate Saltburn, and then the journey when he goes there. Wow, you know, like the first thirty minutes are tame compared to what you see when this is all said and done. 
It's crazy. Now, much of Emerald Fennel's work has always been around predominantly centered around female protagonists. And she talks about that. I don't think our imaginations are limited really to just ourselves, or at least I hope there aren't. The way that Oliver was presented himself to me was so visceral and so deeply felt. It was always a story I wanted to tell next. Now, she has a take on her homoeroticism as decisively fresh, small but impactful shots littered throughout the film, showcasing her unique ability to capture intimacy. Yeah, she's trying about that. This is true. You see, you know, yeah, if you are, I mean, if you want to go and get turned on by the film, I mean, you could, you know, as you are into it, okay. It's the female gaze at its very best, they said. But there's something about making a film where everything is charged with erotic and violent tension. Sexual desire and transgression permeate throughout the film, even in the simplest of shots. The way we shoot the house is, a, is as a fetish object, and every person in this house is enormously sexually seductive as well as repellent. Once you're alive, once your senses get stimulated to a certain degree, it, all, it does become scorched earth. It does touch everything. There are no limits. I think there's lots of people that feel this way about desire, and understandably so that it can't have a name put on it, that it isn't directed in one particular way, that it's limitless. Listen, you know, if anybody had whatever thoughts they had of this movie, I don't know what you can think about it, but like, I knew it was going to be something sick and twisted. I just didn't know it was going to be this. You know, it was just that. It really was. Now, set in 2006, you see hardcover copies of Harry Potter, low-waisted pants abound, soundtrack transport you back, Songs also including from MGMT, Block Party, Cold War Kids. Uh, there's a Farley who's one of the characters in the movie who's a very much a, you know, kind of just a jerk prick against Oliver, but very close to the Catton family is wearing a dump him shirt about the iconic paparazzi shot of Britney Spears. So the movie takes an unexpected turn, slowly beginning its descent to darkness before the audience has even fully registered what's going on. Yeah, once you get in the salt burn, it's like, okay, What's going on here? You don't see the pure madness. It makes South Fork look like Disneyland. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like that. I, I'm i I'm trying to think. Is there any movie that really gave me that kind of salaciousness that far of that I've seen? I can't tell you. But this felt, it felt pretty close to watching porn. High, high class porn. It really felt like that. By the way, I would not be surprised if an adult film company decides to come across and decides to replicate Saltburn in a movie with their stars. This movie absolutely will create that chance. Okay? I could see that happening, no doubt about it. Describing the viewer's experience is challenging to the sheer absurdity for some scenes. So, first of all, Oliver slurping up Felix's jizz filled bath water. The cloudy water, he's down on the on the into the tub and he's just going at it. After he saw Felix jack off in the tub. <laughs> then we saw him buck, buck dance buck naked and dancing to murder the dance floor, his flaccid penis flailing in the wind, unhinged, pure and simple. An Emerald film makes the point that in lots of the scenes, you have people laughing, people screaming, people squealing, writh writhing, mortified, unable to look, can't stop looking, turned on, freaked out. That's what it should be about, going to the movies. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I probably would have been laughing, and I probably would have been like, whoa, I would have pulled back in my chair. Because I've been like, damn, what are you doing here? She relishes in this discomfort, she says. This. What's thrilling is that you want to be able to get under people's skin to the degree that nobody can quite agree what they're watching or how it should make them feel. I think there's a lot of stuff in this film that everyone reacts so differently to in every single scene. You're right. You're right. But this is the part where, like, we need movies like this that push, not just push the envelope, but almost tear it open. Because, unfortunately no matter how salacious or depraved or debaucherous this movie is, this movie is one of the most creative things we've seen out there in a long, in a while. Like a really 
genuinely original movie this was. So I'm just saying something about this, okay? You don't have to like this movie. There are a lot of people that do not like this movie that I would also not recommend to watch this movie at all. My cousin, right? She is a big movie goer. And by the way, she's seen a lot of horror movies. I can't go see horror movies. I come on into it. But even I told her about this movie and I didn't tell her about what happened, in it, but she heard enough to say, I'm not watching it. <laughs> it's like, you know, she's just not into it. This is like sexual gore. Like, it's kind of like that. Like, if you're in the horror movies, you could definitely be into this. And trust me, I have more than enough people that I know that relished in it and love this. Movie. Like, you know, listen, I liked it. I really did. Those scenes, you know, if I watch it again, probably we'll skip through this a little bit. We'll just kind of hit the, hit the forward button a little bit. I need to go and pass up. I can't, I can't go through that sometimes. It's just, oof. Now, then she goes on, and I already saw this coming too. I was like, okay. Oliver going down on Felix's sister, Venetia, and she's on her period. They make the point that period sex is still something that's shrouded in taboo and barely spoken about in life. But despite this, it's not an area that Fennel shrives away from. This is one of the parts that they just like, okay. She says, I think it's just really hot. <laughs> it's a, just it's such a tender scene, an act of service, which we rarely see. And I get the story behind it. I mean, Oliver obviously is trying to like play the, you know, like the, like Captain Savaho over here, but it's like, okay. And you want to go ahead and go down to her when she's bloody. And he does. Plus taking some of the bloody and putting it in her mouth. Damn. That's yeah. Okay. The period sex scene also acted as a greater metaphor for the overall themes of salt burn, especially with questions around power, who has it and who, how you get it. See, that's the other thing too. When we're watching this, you know, we don't know who Oliver is, right? And then we get, and then, but the thing is, all this stuff goes on. You couldn't get away with this movie unless you give us the ending, which for me was the best part. Like, seriously, understanding all these people getting knocked off and seeing what Oliver's intent was, I'm like, you know, I love those plot twists. I love seeing movies when they give that full reveal of like, no, this is what you thought. This isn't what you thought. This isn't what you thought. And look at this to a complete turnaround. And they explain it. And I'm like, and, but that's one of those where it's like, okay, but you went to this level, Oliver, to go ahead and fuck those people over. Okay. By the way, I'm going to have to make this, I'm going to have to make this definitely an episode, not for kids. This is, yeah, this is like 18 plus right here. Come on. This is for adults only. But yeah, I was like, the depths that he was able to go ahead and step down to. And obviously we got to meet the parents of him, right? And it looked like his parents were like normal everyday people. Like, okay, they sound like they're, they look like a fine family. And even Felix said so, but it's like, you know, this guy is mental. Uh, you know, Oliver is mental all across the board. This guy is narcissistic manipulative he's just deceptful he's a sociopath he's a psychopath that's what that guy is and he got away with it all and the worst part was like okay he doesn't take on rosamund pike's character right he doesn't he doesn't go along with taking her character like really he didn't want her so he just decided no 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 we're gonna just no we're not gonna worry about that like it's wild that her character is not what he wanted. But no, he decided she was almost treated like she was like the nicest of the crew. And look, she it looks like she got treated the worst. She got tortured. Like what kind of sick twisted mind did you have? What is wrong with you? But that's what the movie meant to do. You want to talk about shock value, you want to talk about salaciousness? I got it. It totally got it. Now he's been told in the scene before that Venetia is a masochist and that she has an eating disorder. And what he does in the next scene is to tell her body that her body is beautiful and everything about it is a beautiful and a turn on no qualms, no squeamishness about her. 
he dedicates himself to her pleasure. So she says, while Saltburn can be shocking, it's not just for shock value. When it asks you to eat the rich, it's a call to dissect complex that class dynamics. When it makes you squirm, it begs you to interrogate why you're simultaneously aroused. Brimming with profound reflections on power, class, sexuality, and desire, and easily the most shocking film of the year. Right. So that's what they got. That's what they went up with all together. And let me tell you, you want to talk about some real like shock value? You should read what some of these college news, uh, these college publications wrote about this. I got a handful of those they're going to bring up as well that they really decided to go ahead and make some points about it. But no, no, that's the a favorable review. Let's go to a not favorable review. Let's go to the real criticism, the Catholic review. I can't believe that somebody actually did a review on this, but they did. Oh boy. So now, in the 1945 novel, Bryce had revisited. The Catholic author, Evelyn Waugh, charted the intense quasi-romantic and possibly sexual bond between two male students at Oxford University. And that movie was, that was echoed in this comedy, Saltburn. So they go along here, and in the story they say that, you know, this has to do with the fact that, you know, there's free-willing sexual behavior on display eventually lapsing into stomach churning perversity such gross devious un deviance unfolds moreover against the backdrop of fennel's relentlessly bleak portrayal of human nature and the british class system as depressing as the sordid it rests on an elaborate but sinking foundation and this is the other part they say okay the, the describing the movie is brief gore aberrant sexual activity masturbation voyeurism full male and rear nudity several uses of profanity Numerous milder oaths, as well as pervasive, rough, and occasional crude language. Morally offensive. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the said of it. Like, but see, when you get reviews like that, you know, it's one of those things where like, it's that? I gotta go watch this movie. Did you hear about this? I gotta go watch this movie. That's what they all talk about. Now, Back to the sex scene with Venetia and Ollie, right? We learned that this movie, in this movie, that this scene, one of the most riveting scenes, was completely improvised. So Variety spoke with Barry Keegan, and he recalled asking director Emerald Fennell, can I have a closed set? I'd like to try something. On paper, he was apparently just supposed to cry by Felix's grave, which, oh, no, no, this is about him humping the grave. Oh, my goodness. Okay. That's the part. All right, all right. So he was supposed to just cry by Felix's grave, which would have been a pretty standard grieving scene that wouldn't have ruffled any feathers, but far less memorable. But Keegan said, no, quote, I wanted to see what actually happened, where I would take him. I wanted to be confused and let my body lead the way. What am I doing? How can I get closer? Is trying to find that new level of obsession, trying to level up on the obsession. Well, he'd already slurped up jizz filled bath water, which now apparently is a secret menu Starbucks drink. And there are drinks being made of Felix's bath water. That's already coming out now. That's becoming a thing. So here's what Keegan says. Throughout the film, he's, his character is obsessed with Felix in an all-encompassing way. All complicated by the fact that Felix is apparently straight. And that their class differences likely mean the two can never make really real relationship work. Now, that's interesting. That was the other part we never really took apart. I always thought that Felix would have gone both ways. So I almost felt like we're... Oliver was like, all right, something about him makes me think that he would go ahead and like fool around. Cause he obviously thought that Ollie. So they go across and they say, now Felix is dead and Ollie's desire is fully unattainable. He's a lost boy. who's confused and doesn't know what he's chasing. So <laughs> he's basically doing what would uh, uh, someone like the same thing you would say was necrophilia. Yeah. Sex with the dead. And he did it twice. He did it twice. And so she recalls, he recalls how Fennel suggested to him beforehand that Ollie would probably do something along these lines. She didn't tell him exactly what to do. She plants seeds, Emerald. You know what I mean. And so as confused as Ollie's obsession was in the moment, his motivations go forward. He goes right back to his class climbing schemes and even more ruthless and efficiency with, than we see from him yet. And 
his actions in the final act, they argue that it make it less interesting. His final monologue takes a complex story and Oprah simplifies it to a straightforward eat the rich narrative. But one all could also argue that it instead makes Ollie's early actions retroactively, retroactively more interesting. If Felix had never discovered the truth about Ollie's home life, if Ollie had never felt the need to discreetly poison him to prevent his big secret from getting out, what would have happened instead? Would he have just murdered Felix just a little later on? Or would Felix reciprocating his love or lust be enough to get Ollie to ease the brakes on this insane scheme of his? It doesn't answer the question, this movie, but it makes it clear when and where the source of all his desires, which is fully degreed. He's ba- <laughs> even right on there. He's banging Felix's grave is the closest thing he'll get to consummating the relationship. Yes. He inserts into the dirt after Felix has been buried. But then after the scene, all starts chasing something far more tenable than Felix's love. He does it with so much far more success. But yeah, <laughs> that is wild. It was improvised. Who would have thought that? There's much more being said about it. TikTok also falling along with this as well. For whatever reason, now we now we have the challenge where we now see murder on the dance floor being danced around, and some people might not, not even know why it's going on. Now we have the karaoke secrets. It's also beginning really a big deal. So Archie Medeque plays Farley and Saltburn. By the way. Good, you know, good acting job. This guy, I hated him. <laughs> Doesn't stand him. But his character, Farley, um, he dresses the viral karaoke scene from the hit film. He plays Farley Start, a member of the Catton family who's visiting the titular estate for the summer. I didn't know he was a part of the family. I wasn't paying attention. Okay. And so he discusses the karaoke scene. His friends are constantly sending me TikToks of Saltburn and edits of the karaoke scene. And he said, asked whether he would release a full single of him singing the song Rent. And he said, despite the demands of fans, he would not release a full single of the song, but he's humbled and pleasantly surprised by all the attention. And by the way, I can tell you that Farley, when you have him like completely screw over, get screwed over because of Oliver and get thrown out of the house. Yeah. Like when they, they're... <laughs> when they have to close off the dining room and they close the shades with those red shades so that the family cannot see Felix's body being carried out of the maze and Farley and everybody else eating this gruel that they're eating, whatever this pie, whatever it is. And of course, Oliver loves it. And just seeing this family just crumbling apart and Ollie's just like, ah, fine. And he knows he's already at Korea out of favor. Like he's persona non grata now to the house and they want him out. But the, the matriarch wants him to stay and nobody understands why, but everybody finds out the ending that he's been lying and manipulating all along. And while public humiliation is still not a great approach for Farley, he faces unfair consequences when he's ousted prematurely. And they believe he encouraged her son Felix to do lines of cocaine and then drink. And then the biting nature of the Saltburn karaoke scene only adds to Farley's complexity as well as while still harsh, he turned out to be right in his suspicions towards Oliver. So like I said, there's now a secret Saltburn bath water drink from TikTok. Starbucks. Somebody actually did that. So here we go. So now there's a start. There is a the drink. So it is now nothing more than a delicious customized Starbucks ice white mocha uh, cho- uh, chocolate mocha by the way in the film Keegan's character was actually drinking yogurt milk and water mixed together to look like jizz okay there we go so you got to go to the Starbucks and you ask for a venti ice white chocolate mocha chocolate mocha and sub out the whipped cream for a vanilla sweet cream cold foam made from white chocolate mocha sauce and then you add a white chocolate mocha drizzle to really achieve the, you know what in your cup. <laughs> wow. Wow. This movie, man. And then you can also replace the two shots of espresso with an initial two pumps of white chocolate mocha sauce. Yeah, this is like, this is the craze. And then another person writes, this is from the observer. And I don't know what, Oh, this is for, the online newspaper serving Notre Dame, St. Mary's, and Holy Cross. It's 
TikTok directed the movie Saltburn. This is the college folks that are talking about this movie. Limited one month one, one, one month run, twenty million dollars it made worldwide. And Saltburn context so far has seen has already had over four billion views on TikTok. Saltburn was fated to succeed, not because it's good, but because it's postable. The movie is laden with montages, mostly of Jacob Elordi walking and standing handsome and silent. These sequences feel like montages and more like fan cams that are designed to be screen recorded and reposted by fan accounts on TikTok. The final scene of Barry Keegan prancing gleefully around an ornate mansion has the same quality. A complete non sequitur. But, you know, could have been intended to be ripped from the movie and posted online or maybe to be turned into a TikTok dance. The script and acting often prioritize Twitter-ready, gifable moments, gifable moments, right? And one-liners over genuine emotion, making for characters who come off as artificial and inhumane. And he mentions that viewing Saltburn is less like watching a movie and more like scrolling a feed. Well, I can see where that comes from. It feels lab-grown, cynically catering to market research and pop culture, rom-coms, and schlock movies. That's a good thing. But because Saltburn tries to be art house, it insists on its own pretensions and comes off as confused, disingenuous even. I don't agree with that. Because, you know, take away the four scenes. Okay? Take away the period sex scene. Take away, you know, the confrontation by Oliver to Felix getting on top of him. Or what he did to Farley. Or take away the bathtub scene. Take away the humping on the grave. (laughs) Listen to me talking about this. And take away him. My goodness, this movie, man. This movie really just did did a number on me on this. You know what I'm saying? Let me at least do the right thing and give Elspeth Catton her praise because that name is really like something else. So this, yes, Elspeth getting humped as she is dying on a hospital bed in her home in Saltburn because this twisted fuck decided to go ahead and, you know, leave her to the point where she's like barely breathing and left on, you know, a ventilator. And then he takes the tube, the breathing tube out, lets her go away. And once her last breath is gone, he gets on top and starts humping her. This, this is like, yeah, that's what's going on. And yeah. So that's the part they're talking about where like in the movie itself, I will say this. They, there's a good story in this. Like they they did tell the plot is pretty solid. The storytelling is, you know, it, it makes all sense. It's all connected. Like that's a pretty well written movie. And the, and obviously the, the lines are pretty <laughs> salacious and crazy, but it works. So this person said it was bad. Well, they, again, this is, they're very Catholic. So like that part was obviously people really got upset about. You know, I'm one of those that, listen, I worked in some areas that are very salacious in my career. By the way, January 30th is coming up. It will be my 30th anniversary in broadcasting. And I will take a moment to go ahead and celebrate that here on the program in two weeks. So look forward to that. We'll talk about that coming up. So yeah, there's that part. And then we move along in. Then we hear about the comeback of Club Kids celebrating the resurgence. Saltburn catapults murder on the dance floor onto the charts. This is coming from Yahoo Entertainment. The song has appeared on more than 160,000 Instagram reels and over 200,000 TikTok clips as of Tuesday afternoon. Sophie Alex Baxter gave Saltburn director Emerald Fennell permission to include the song in the film. She never expected it to resonate so deeply with new fans. And she talked to BBC and said, quote, it actually feels really magical, and if I'm honest, I don't think I've completely processed it really. It's extraordinary. It's a song I've been singing for over 20 years. I still love singing it. I love the way people react to it live. But for new people to be discovering it, for me to be making new memories with new people, it's kind of beautiful. And this goes back to when we had, you know, this goes back to when we had uh, Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill become so viral thanks to Stranger Things and the Master of Puppets by Metallica in the same vein, right? 
So that's one of the comparisons we're getting right now. And by the way, you know, Sophie Alex Baxter, smart girl. The song is being released on vinyl for the first time on February 16th. So for many Gen Xers like myself, it takes them back to a time of vibrant transformation. It looks like the beats. The song echoed through the clubs of New York city, capturing the essence of a new millennium. And they talk about the club kids movement, a prominent group of New York's life life scene characterized by flamboyant fashion at extravagant parties during the eighties and nineties felt nostalgic after hearing the song in Saltburn. So the original club kids movement faded in the two thousands due to a changing social climate. And the legacy is reflected in songs like Murder in the Dance Floor. The song's title became personal to some as they toured clubs around the world. And they talked to other people that were the city kids that got a part of this and really, you know, appreciate what was going on here. It's emblematic of an era that rewarded rule breakers and trendsetters. So this could cause a fashion uh, phase. It could also create something where, you know, Something might happen where we get people starting to dress in the such. You know, the like Saltburn could also actually inspire fashion, could inspire music. And 2006 music, the music, especially the music they chose, especially like the music from the Killers and so all. Yeah, I love it. Let's bring it back. Let's get people into it. So like I said, the college kids were talking about this. They were constantly going on about it. So let's take from some other college publications, if you will. From the Georgetown Hoya. They say that the movie shocks audiences with dramatic twists and a spectacle on the dance floor. It's rich with classist microaggressions and social commentary, but has a few crazy, unbelievable scenes that detract some from the movie, both sacrificing rewatchability for viewers' shock, uh, shock and overpowering the movie's messaging. Keegan does an amazing job portraying the complexity and sinister undertone of Oliver's... Yeah, sinister is a good word. There you go. One is torn by understanding Oliver's desire for wealth one could only dream of, yet being disgusted by his actions both morally and literally. The glamour in the film is reminiscent of many newer teen dramas that creates a beautiful mosaic atmosphere through elegant cinematography and a piercing score, further hypnotizing quality. Various scenes throughout my theater were gasping and squirming on our seats. Oliver pushed the R rating to its limit with his ending nude dance. Extended drink, by the way, yet yeah, how often do we see get somebody's dong in front view on camera, but it was allowed. They dominated the conversation, which much more the meaning of all notions of the film deals with. But this becomes for them, this writer, a hilarious and fun experience for the first time viewer. Shocking effect decreases on repeat watches, but a rewatch will allow the viewer to appreciate the hints that Emerald Fennel drops as Oliver's real nature is throughout the earlier scenes. The intrigue does not compensate for what is lost on the secondary screening. But yeah, you got to watch it once. And if you want to watch it again, watch it for the fun. Like, you know, kind of like a spectator sport. Probably the best way to look at it. Now, for some, there are getting some things where this movie is getting quite a bit of, you know, talk about it, right? Like, there's there's quite a few things right now where, okay, salt-rated clips right now have notched up 4 billion views on TikTok. And the movie is getting nominated. It's been nominated for both BAFTAs, okay? The... Those, I want to make sure if you didn't know what those are, that's the BAFTA Film Awards, the British Academy Film Awards. So their version of the Emmys, which is coming up in February. So this movie's going to be nominated for that. And Saltburn's receiving the name, same number of BAFTA nominations as the top grossing film of 2023, Barbie. And Oppenheimer leads the BAFTA field among all of them with 13 nominations, just so you know about that. Another college, Luther College. I never heard about this college, but okay. It's a college in Decorah, Iowa. Okay, so Middle America and their comments about this. The writer writes, thank God I didn't watch this with my parents. <laughs> yeah, this might be like a personal viewing. Do you want to watch with other people? Make sure they're very sexually minded before you do that. Not a bad idea, just to say. So, Niam Mi, that's the, at least what I think how, how this is being pronounced. So, she watched the movie. 
and said that, quote, I watched Saul Burning. I wouldn't characterize myself as a movie person at all. Whenever I'm asked what my favorite movie is, I have to wrap my brain for anything that I've seen in the last three to six months. But when Salt Burn quickly invaded my TikTok feed, I knew such as nothing about it. I know I had to see it. Honestly, that's the way I feel about it too. I couldn't help myself. <sighs> wow. Okay. So honestly, she writes here: it's not as insane as everybody made it out to be. By the reactions to scenes that people were putting up on TikTok, I was expecting to have my, to prop up my jaw to the, due to the sheer horror of whatever happened to that house. But it wasn't quite the case. I mean, there was jaw dropping moments. You know, uh, Oliver drinking. Felix's bathwater or Oliver fucking a grave. You know, she writes, I will never be able to hear Lord of all hopefulness in the same way again. <laughs> and Oliver dancing around the mention couple naked. Um, yeah. Barry Keegan did some weird stuff for this movie, but I do think that all the strangely motivated actions of his character were incredibly believable further in the feeling of Oliver's obsession with Felix. Even if they were unscripted and improvised, that was really good. Yes, Rosamund Pike, standout performance. I loved her in this movie. She's great in everything. Come on. I mean, come on. Gone Girl. Do I have to say anything else? She was amazing in that movie. Amazing. I got to go back and watch that, as a matter of fact. Uh, she plays a blissfully, blissfully ignorant high-class woman. Big streak of the movie was cinematography. Visually beautiful. It, it was true. They did they, shoot it really well. Really well. Old-fashioned square aspect. Racial pretentious. Added to the film by Plenty of the Fumer, Viewer firmly in 2006. Excellent soundtrack. But you know what? She might not be able to listen to Murder on the Dance Floor. I don't know. That song just is... I don't remember listening to it. I might have heard it in 2006. Maybe. But, you know, it was before You know, we were listening to CDs. We were not listening to streaming yet. And it wasn't that easy to go ahead and you know, do the peer-to-peer. -peer. Like, we had LimeWire and Napster, but it wasn't that easy to use. Not even back then. Like it would have been hard with a DSL, right? But now I hear that song again. And I'm like, it's like a new song. It feels fresh. It, it's catchy. It's infectious. It's a banger. I love it. So I'm glad it came back. And that's why I think we're, once again, America's going to get subjected to another movie, uh, uh, another project, a TV or movie, that's going to create a song to go viral on the charts and America will finally give a song. It's just due. I love that. I got a lot. Now this college writer also picks the picks. Some of the things that were brought up in terms of the her being an English major, appreciating the way that the script framed Felix as Icarus flying too close to the sun is desire to be a benefactor for lesser creatures. The Greek mythology theme continues with the image of the Minotaur, a monster that was sentenced to live in a labyrinth fed by human sacrifices. Theseus, the hero of the myth kills the Minotaur, Minotaur ending the human sacrifices while also manipulating the Royal family and getting all their power in the end. Sound familiar on the salt burn estate. They have all that. And the most thoughtfully symbolic elements of plot seem to deviate from the slightly clumsy nature of the rest of the film. It goes trying too hard to be shocking, which was inevitable because it feels like there was never been this kind of movie in mainstream culture for a while. But also it's because we've had movies that were very salacious and very like sex filled and, you know, but nothing like this in a long time. That's the other part. So there's a story from there talking about that. So in conclusion on this, the fascination of what this movie has done, what it's done for the soundtrack, the sensation that has created all over social media, Instagram, TikTok, like you, you see it out there. People are talking about it. And it's had a couple, I mean, it did not even get the kind of virality that it did in November when it came out and, and debuted. But the more people saw this, the more buzz, the more groundswell I'll talk about this movie to the point that I didn't know if I was going to watch it. I wasn't sure. And I was like, okay, I'm going to watch it. And Monday night I decided, okay, I'm going to do it. I will sit down. I'm going to watch this. And I did. And I, and I, by the way, I really will watch a movie from home. I am not, I am so against streaming movies because I feel like there's a quality component to the fact that. If I'm going to go see a movie in the theater, you know, that the producers, directors, the, the filmmakers, the studios are banking on the fact that this movie is going to make money. 
And they're willing to go and do that. So when they put a Liam Neeson movie out there, or Gerard Butler movie, which is basically a B-movie, and, you know, you think, well, okay, how well can it do? Well, they're willing to put it out in the theaters. So that's good enough for me. I don't go see it. Like right now, January for February, we're getting some independent movies that I would never expect to be on there. I got a movie called Cult Killer, which is with, with Antonio Banderas and Alice Eve. Do I expect this movie to be like Grammy, uh, the Emmy, uh, this be a Oscar winning movie? No, not even close, but it's, you know, good popcorn movie. I saw The Beekeeper with Jason Statham last week. I thought it was great. Popcorn movie. It's what I expect for January movies. I'm expecting American fiction as soon as it comes out. I don't know why it hasn't come out yet in theaters. Well, I mean, it did before. I think it did where I was at, but I couldn't catch it. So like, I'm trying to figure out, all right, when am I going to get to watch this movie? Is it going to come out in theaters after the Oscar buzz, after the For You Consideration stuff so I can watch it? Because that's one thing that sucks, man. I, sometimes I can't get some of these movies because they're Oscar nominated. I used to have a, mov- a movie theater in Boca, which was a Regal, that I would go to to watch all these kind of movies. But... You know, they take these movies and you know, like you, you, you catch them there with like if they're there for like a week or two, the critically acclaimed. My regal won't play them because they're the, 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 the theater so suburban. But the Boca theater was very art house because of where it was back in the day. That was the theater that used to run a lot of foreign films, the Shadowwood. But when they moved it, I was like, well, I'm not going to get that anymore. And that sucks. But Saltburn, we need more movies like that. Now, maybe not so much sexual and deviation like deviant and sinister and you know just sick and twisted i mean not much more to say about it but we could use more movies that really push the envelope but that's what's missing and i think that's the part that everybody needs to realize look at what this movie did this movie this is like 12 million dollar indie movie yeah amazon and mgm put this together they put it out there for a month and it made money and now they're putting on Amazon Prime, and people are talking about it, and it's being watched. People are all over it. It's incredible. So I'm really, I was impressed by this. And you know what? Hey, it gave me a good episode to talk about because I didn't know if I was going to do a show about this. Like I thought about it. I thought I was going to do it for the Praise of the Botrys, and I said, like, "No, I'm not going to do it for that." And then I just saw, I just really thought about the fact that, okay, look at all this stuff that this movie has created, what it's fostered. I'm saying, oh, you know what? I'm going to do it for this show. And I also wanted to wait until it was the best possible time. Like if I wait later than like next week or the week after they're going to do this movie and talk about it, probably would have been too late. Like right now it's, it's at the peak of mainstream appeal. People are still talking about it. So like right now, it's probably the latest I could probably do this. I could have probably watched the movie much earlier, like somewhere earlier in January. I could have done that. And then I could probably would have commented on this movie before, but if I was going to do it, I wanted to make sure I didn't get any excuses from people saying, Oh, well you're spooling it. Okay. I just did you the favor. I waited until the last possible moment because after next week, I probably won't talk about this. There'll be other things to talk about, but you know, the news right now has been kind of quiet. You know, I mean, just it's been kind of like that all year so far about what's been going on, about like, what to talk about. So the comedians were getting canceled and all that. That was good for last week. And then the bankruptcy stuff worked really well for the first week of the year. And now here we go. I'm going to bring that up again. An update on Odyssey. Here's what they're doing right now in terms of their preparation for bankruptcy. The reorganization. So Odyssey moved, they, they were, they signed retention agreements with four of its top executives this month, three days before it filed its chapter 11 a reorganization in a Houston court. Bonuses totaling $1.35 million, and each was unanimously approved by the board's competition committee. So their CFO, COO, President Chief Digital Officer, and Executive VP General Counsel all made between three hundred and four hundred dollars and $425,000 in bonuses. They're expected to be paid on July 1st, as long as the organization process is completed by then. The bonuses are in addition to what executives would normally receive. Although the filing says it may reduce how much they get bonus when bonus time rolls around in 2025. And the filing says that other members of the company's senior management team have also received the retention bonus, but how much was paid and how many employees were set to receive the money has not been disclosed. Oh, see, this is the part that really sucks. In bankruptcy, all these top executives are still getting bonuses. 
for going into the debt and taking the company into bankruptcy. They're getting bonuses. For what? Why is that money not going towards their debt? Why is it being accepted and allowed? Audit has been under financial pressure for an extended period when it filed Chapter 11. And an agreement worked out with lenders, Odyssey filed a prepackaged bankruptcy petition on January 7th, cutting its outstanding debt from $1.9 billion to $350 million, with the debt holders receiving an ownership stake in the reorganized company. And then David Field, the CEO, before going to court, signed an amended contract, keeping him on the role as the board of the reorganized company in a non-chairman capacity. It did not change his role as CEO. But once the company exits Chapter 11, there will be six, we have four months to reach terms on a new contract. And if it doesn't happen, Field can opt to leave Odyssey with a lucrative severance package, paying him two years base salary, $1.35 million per year, and a $2 million one-time payout. This guy was part of bringing Intercom and CBS together. And you're telling me that this guy could go ahead and leave with roughly what? $3 million? severance out the door leaving this company in shambles this is the part i got pissed off listen please go back and hear that episode a couple weeks ago because i just got really just pissed off at them like this is the the audacity of these radio companies to just go and go on and be thrown away like this but it doesn't have to be that way so honestly made a arranged a prepackaged reorganization with its debt holders, but some analysts have said one of the questions is whether the new owners will look for new leadership or retain the executives who have an intimate knowledge of the assets. We assume the banks who will control the money, quote, and will likely install a new management to continue running the RDC radio stations and digital assets, according to Craig Huber of Hubert Research Partners. So yeah, the banks don't want these people. The same people that brought it to the ground, you think they want to stay? No. Get them out. Get them out now. A couple other stories I want to bring up real quick. There was a talk about mergers and acquisitions. That might be a new thing right now. Hollywood's profit problem that they're talking about that. Is consolidation going to be the answer? And Variety's Cynthia Littleton, Todd Spangler, and Jennifer Mass posed that question. And that Hollywood's largest media conglomerates are hip deep in a cycle of merger and acquisition mania after years of disruption in traditional TV and film and a particularly chaotic year in 2023. And they said it's, come, it's been becoming clear to many that deal making the bulk of a content and distribution assets is no longer the cure for the industry's problems that it has been since the 1990 nuptials of Time Warner. And the threat to Hollywood's old ways of making money posed by the rise of streaming platforms is too dire and too fundamental. So, what happened in 2020? The streaming disruption, the digital disruption itself, culminating with the streaming services coming out. Four years ago, <clears throat> these companies thought, well, let's just put more content, spend more money on content, more money on distribution. Well, now they're saying, well, it's not going to work. We got to do something else. So they said, well, we're going to consolidate. We're going to put more companies together. So potential M&A transactions revolving around Paramount Global, Warner Brothers Discovery, Comcast's NBC Universal Division. They're all being looked at in the merger and acquisition fund right now. We talked about Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount Global having a meeting, informal. Wall Street didn't like it, and insiders also were very upset about it. The prospect that Comcast might jump into the mix considers options for NBC Universal has had an intrigue, but not much excitement. The one-time bedrocks of the businesses, cable TV channels, box office receipts are shrinking. And it's hard to find the long-term rationale for bringing together lost generating streamers and aging cable channels as we be the case for any combination of these three entities. There's a lot there. They go on to say that more talk of M&A is starting to feel like a shell game to the industry rank and file. We question the logic of continuing to bulk up when traditional entertainment giants are struggling against changing tides. They're now directly competing with tech giants, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, that have exponentially more resources and stronger balance sheets. By the way, Google, they're dropping Google Podcasts. And now all the podcasts, if you want to have your podcast up on anything Google-related, 
they're now going to have you export them to YouTube and YouTube Music because now YouTube is now going to be allowing RSS feeds. So now you can put your audio podcasts proper on YouTube and YouTube Music. That's a major game changer. Keep an eye on that, folks. You podcasters out there, that is now underway. That was announced on Friday. Now it's going to become the play. So watch out for that. So the big corporate giants of media, they don't know what they're doing. But the analysts are saying that their unlimited deal is probably going to transpire within the next year. Uh, one person says there's not enough buyers, too many risks. There's a lot of talk. But who's going to pull the trigger? It's not clear anybody is going to step up. Story to go and wrap things up. In music is a different kind of streaming fraud, that there are one million manipulated tracks on audio streaming services. Rusty Turek, Rasty Turek, excuse me, spoke of Music Business Worldwide on their podcast, and this guy is the founder and CEO of PEX. They track and analyze copyrighted content on digital services. And according to their tech, that is over a million tracks on audio streaming services like Spotify, Apple Music, and Tidal, representing a headache for music rights holders. There's modified audio on some of these, which means an original track has been sped up, slowed down, or otherwise manipulated, then uploaded as an entirely new recording. So, Unless these million-plus tracks have legally licensed the original recording on which they're based, they're infringing copyright. And they're pulling royalties away from the original artist in question. Ah! So, there's a problem right now. So, in some of these cases, the credit artist on each track, and therefore, presumably, the artist's account collecting royalties, is not the original artist in question. So, keep an eye on that. That's also going on as well. That some of those artists out there you know, they're losing on our royalties because of other people, you know, just switching around the music. The speeding up thing, I was actually kind of surprised hearing about that, that was being allowed, and that there are some artists that are getting their songs sped up, and people don't know about it. Like, you know, to the point where, I mean, Spotify and other services have created sped up playlists, curated. Which is, that's not going to look well, but I don't, nobody's really talking about it. So we got to keep that in mind too and follow what's going on. So there you go. All right. That's the program. <laughs> Wild and crazy. And, you know, I encourage when movies like Saltburn, as I say off the off top of the show, I will say that because of what it as does to the pop culture, what it does to the culture itself, you know, what a refreshing change. So what we normally get from, you know, the, the onuses of a, what is it? Remember, you know, the tanking superhero movies, right? This was a big change to that. The lack of movies that came out, you know, critically because of the whole strike of last year. Saltburn came out from the woodwork and really created buzz. No matter how sexually deviant and debaucherous it was. Anyway, that's the program. Kingofpodcasts.com's website. That's the same name for all the social media. Until next week, remember the content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. <laughs>